welcome to the First Presbyterian Church on June 28th. We're glad that you're here. Join me in our call to worship. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet our heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth and have so much more value than they? prayer of confession. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Do we forget the debt we have to so many who help provide our daily bread and needs? Open my lips, I will sing your praise forever. 
My family and I spent many years in California, and I get different reactions when I tell people that. And one of the most consistent ones I get from non-Californians is, how can you stand the earthquakes? Well, living in Southern California, occasionally the earth moves. Came to West Texas and they have tornadoes, but there's something about the earth moving that's unnerving. Somehow we think that the earth, well, it's like bedrock. It should be something you can count on. And when suddenly it moves, it is unnerving. We need those things in our lives that we can count on. The Bible uses a number of illustrations where it uses an illustration to God, back to God is our bedrock, God is our foundation, lead me to the rock higher than I. So, so the Bible understands how we, we have this association with, with firm ground. This week, we're beginning to take a look at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. It begins, pray like this. Here is a model prayer. The disciples wanted to know, teach us, how do we pray? And he said, well, do this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It opens with those words, Our Father. Those two words catch a major theme in both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. Almost every one of Paul's letters that make up so much of the New Testament begin in one way or another with a phrase that goes, Grace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament, Malachi chapter 2, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? If we have one Father, we are all in some ways siblings, brothers and sisters to one another. Why are we faithless to one another? Why do we harm one another? Why do we treat one another like we're not related? This is one of the most basic down-to-earth implications of those first two words of the Lord's Prayer, our Father. We are all children of that one Father and should treat each other that way. We don't want to be people who are faithless to one another. Now, normally, I don't feel my teeth. I just assume they're there and there they are. But, but occasionally, if you get a toothache, all of a sudden, your whole body knows that that tooth is there. It's got your attention well, this idea that we're all brothers and sisters, and when some of us hurt, it should have the attention of all of us. We should all be concerned when some part of our huge family is getting the short end of the stick. In James chapter 3, James writes that with our mouths, we bless God. And then we turn right around and curse people with the very same mouth. How can, we, how can we bless the Lord and Father and turn around and curse others who are made in the likeness of God who are part of that great family? And James says that it, it shouldn't be that way. Could a, it's not proper. A spring of water doesn't bring forth fresh water and then salt water. Fig trees don't bear, well, thorns, and, and thorn bushes don't wear, bear fig trees. How we treat one another is found in those first two words of that prayer. Our Father. In the book of Ephesians, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, 
the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of the reverence for Christ, that God calls us to a position of servanthood. We're not to lord it over each other. We're not to get unfair advantage over those others who are that great crowd of sibling brothers and sisters. We're to have an attitude of servanthood, an attitude where we submit to one another out of a reverence for Christ. That word father. Now my father was largely absent from our family. And to be honest, when he was there, you'd probably rather he wasn't. But just two doors down was my best friend, Gary Richter. And I saw Orville Richter almost every day of my life, growing up. We'd be at Gary's house or a few blocks up at the West Side Welding Shop, Orville's business. What a wonderful place for a couple kids to hang out, a welding shop, a little bit of heaven on earth. And you'd see how Orville did business, how Orville related to his wife, Ruth, how Orville parented his, his, his two sons. Later, as a, a young man, when God got a hold of me in, in San Diego, California, I, I had the privilege of moving in with the Olmsteads. And living with that family in the church, I got to see Lawrence Olmsted for two years. This is how a man acts. This is how a husband is with his wife. This is how a father is with his children. And it was one of the most amazing and wonderful things, just, just kind of soaking it in. Oh, this is what it's like. And after we came here to Lubbock in 2003, still downtown at the old church, and Dick Segarik was one of the real characters down there, a real mainstay of the congregation. And to be honest, there were times when Dick Segarik and I pretty well bumped heads. And one day after we had bumped heads, I was over at his house and he says, Bob, you're as stubborn as I am. I take my compliments where I can find them. And a few years later, when Dick died, I included that little antidote on the card that I sent to Peggy, his widow. About seven weeks after the funeral, Peggy calls me up, says, well, I, I'm starting to go through all the cards. And I, and I got to your card and I, I read that. You're as stubborn as I am. And I could just hear Dick saying it. It made me laugh. And I just wanted to tell you how nice it was to have a, have a, a good thought. He's one of those folks, along with Orville and Lawrence, that helps flesh out what father is. It doesn't matter whether you've had the perfect father or not, or a terrible example of a father. There are examples out there. There are people out there that flesh out what a good parent is, what a good mother is, and fleshes those things out there. So when I begin that prayer, our father, I have some content there. I have some, some something to put there. I was talking to my daughter Carlin earlier this week and I was kind of stuck in this sermon and we were talking about it while I walked and Carlin started talking about me as her father and says, you know, one of the things I like about you, you're consistent, I can count on you. You're always there, you'll always listen to me. I'm consistent, she can count on me. Takes us back to that earthquake. We need things we can count on, things that are consistent in our lives. And that got the wheels going and it led me over to Romans chapter eight, where it says, and we know that God works in all things for the good of those who love God. Now it does not say that all things are good. Some things are terrible, some are tragic, some are awful. But in the midst of all things, God is working for our good. You can count on it. It's consistent. The very next verse after that, for those whom God foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed into those children of God who live by God's ways and God's rules who are reconciled to God. That word predestined, 
a lot of misunderstanding about predestined and predestination. One of the most basic ones is that it is not predetermination. Predetermination says in some ways God just determines everything that's going to happen. We're just kind of on for the ride. In fact, there was an old Scottish woman, a Scottish Presbyterian woman, who really believed in predestination as predetermination. And one day she had a nasty fall, got a good bruise, and she picked herself up and says, well, I'm glad that's over with. No, life isn't like that. You and I, you and I, our lives carry weight and real impact. Our attitudes and our thoughts lead to very real actions for good or for bad. We make very real decisions that harm or help people, harm and help us. God didn't just predetermine everything. We're in this. But in the midst of that, that predestination tells us that God is consistent. You can count on God. God is always working for us. God is always wants the best for us. God is always consistently trying to work us to be faithful children, faithful brothers, sisters in this whole group together underneath our Father and acting the way God would have us act. In Isaiah 64, we read, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. Now, that picture of the potter working on the wheel, he centers up the clay, begins to work on that pot, and, and, and something goes wrong. The clay might not be consistent enough. There's something, and it, it goes off. The potter does not throw away the clay. and God doesn't throw us away either. The potter starts over again, reworks the clay, gets it back, centers again, starts over again. That is a picture of predestination, the God that starts over and over again with us. We are often reworked, but never given up on. You can count on it. We always talk about an offering at this time. And certainly, you can go online and do a financial offering to our church. But that offering, where we offer ourselves willingly into the hands of the potter, where we submit when we we have to be broken back down and reworked. Will we be willing in the hands of that potter? Our time for prayer today. Praying for others, and there's certainly no lack of prayers. The number of cases of COVID-19 here in Lubbock are, are spiking up, it seems like, every day. And many of those folks... They're going, ah, I'm not very sick. That's great. However, we've also seen some young people here in Lubbock. And I like this one guy. He just flat said it. He said, this is not the flu. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. And he was still feeling the effects months after he had it. It's not a game. It's not a toy. It's not nothing. And so we want to pray for those folks who have COVID-19, those especially vulnerable people who might be exposed. And we want to reaffirm that we act for our brother and sister's good by using our masks and keeping distance. So we pray for others. Let us pray together. Lord, help us to have hearts that understand that we are in this together. We're not strangers in this together but we are brothers and sisters underneath our Father in this together. We pray for those who are especially vulnerable folks in populations like our nursing homes. They would be kept away from the virus. We pray for those who have already contracted it, for those who have been affected with it through businesses and through uh, losing their jobs. Remember people close to us in this congregation, Jonathan, 
Lewis, Mavis, Roger, Jerry, Lynn, Lori, Tommy, Frank, Jennifer, Carlin, Modesta, Paula, Braxton, Tasha, Aaron, Megan, Carol, Conley. We have two, two praise the Lords today. We have Amy. Amy is doing well after his surgery. We'll be taking him off the prayer list, and we're grateful for that. And also Aislinn King. She's doing very well in her new job, still looking for a job uh, for Brian King. Remember our, our, our pastor, Ann Mills, up in Bowie? And that you will be with this congregation with that pastor. Lord, you hear these prayers and our concerns. They're not just names on a page to you, just as they're not just names on a page to us. They're flesh and blood. They're people. Lord, we bring ourselves to you. We bring ourselves using that prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you are able to stand, I invite you to stand. May the goodness, the consistent goodness of God touch your hearts, your minds, your actions this week. Amen. Thank you. 